Israel divides the land. Joshua 11 to 22. God had chosen Joshua to lead the children of Israel in defeating their enemies and settling in the promised land. In this lesson, we will learn how they divided the land and learn to trust God as he conquered their enemies. Have you ever had to share a box of donuts with friends? There are so many different kinds and all are so good. Who will get the chocolate one? Or who wants the glazed donuts? Learning to share can sometimes be difficult. Everyone has their own idea of what is best and it can be hard to make everyone happy. That was the challenge that the children of Israel faced after they defeated their enemies and were ready to live in the Promised Land. In this lesson, we are going to learn how Israel divided the land into different places for each of the 12 families of Israel to live. We will see how they also learned to follow God's plan for settling disputes. This story about Joshua and the children of Israel is found in the book of Joshua. Joshua is in the second group of books in the Old Testament called the historical books. These books begin with Joshua and go through Esther. Let's say these books together. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Joshua was the man God chose to lead the children of Israel into the Promised Land. God had promised Joshua that he would be with him wherever he went. God also commanded Joshua to be careful, to completely obey his words, and he promised that he would be prosperous. As Joshua led the Israelites into the land of Canaan, there was a lot of work that needed to be done before the Israelites could safely settle there. The Israelites had to take the land back from the Canaanites. The promised land was occupied by the Canaanite people who did many wicked things. These people did not obey God. They worshiped idols instead of the true God. And because they believed in false gods, God wanted the children of Israel to destroy them. So God told Joshua exactly what to do. The first city they faced was Jericho. Jericho was a highly fortified city with a huge double wall around it. God told Joshua to have seven priests carrying seven trumpets to walk in front of the Ark of the Covenant. These priests were to be followed by the armed men and finally the people of Israel. This caravan was to march around the city of Jericho one time for six straight days. On the seventh day, they were to march seven times around the city. When the priests blew their trumpets and the people shouted to the Lord, the walls of Jericho collapsed and fell to the ground. The wicked city of Jericho was conquered 
because God made the walls fall down. What a miracle God accomplished for Israel on that day. From Jericho, the Israelites marched on to conquer the city of Ai, where God taught them, through the example of Achan, that they must completely obey him in order to be successful. Achan had stolen bounty from the city when God said that the Israelites must bring all the riches of the city to the tabernacle. God wanted the Israelites to know that it was he who was winning the battles for them. It was not their own strength alone. They must learn to praise and rely on him for their victories. After the Israelites took the city of Ai, word quickly spread of their victory. The Canaanites heard how the God of the Israelites had commanded them to destroy the entire city of Jericho because it was so sinful. They were terrified. All the kings who lived in the land met to discuss what to do about the Israelites. The five kings who came to the meeting were from the hill country, from the western foothills, and from all along the entire coast of the Mediterranean Sea, as far north as Lebanon. They came from the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. Finally, the kings all decided that there was only one thing that would work. Everyone must come together and make war against Joshua and the Israelites. That is, everyone except the Gibeonites. Instead of joining those gathering to fight the Israelites, the Gibeonites came up with a devious plan to save their lives. They decided to trick Joshua and the Israelites. They sent some messengers in old worn out clothes with some moldy bread to trick Joshua into believing they were from a far away country. Their trick worked and Joshua made a treaty with the people not to destroy them. When Joshua discovered that he had been lied to, he made the Gibeonites become servants to the Israelites by chopping wood and carrying water. When the kings of the Canaanite nations came against Israel in war, God miraculously saved his people by confusing the enemy and causing them to flee from the battle. Then God sent hailstones to kill the soldiers as they ran away. When Joshua prayed for help, God miraculously stopped the sun and moon for a day so Joshua and his men could pursue and capture the remaining enemy. The Israelites totally wiped out the five armies, except for a tiny remnant that managed to reach their fortified towns. Joshua then captured and destroyed the town of Megadoth. This one big battle enabled Joshua to gain control of the hill country of Bethel and Gibeon. He captured the kings, struck them down, and killed all the people because they were determined to harden their heart toward God. 
From there, he subdued towns in the lowlands. Then his army conquered important armies in the north, such as Hazor. Then Israel conquered land both east and west of the Jordan River, from Mount Hermon in the north to beyond the Negri, to Mount Halak in the south. All of Israel's victories came from God. He delivered Israel from their enemies. Finally, the Israelites went on to capture the cities of Libna, then Eglon, Hebron, and Debir, before returning victoriously to Gilgal. All these cities were destroyed, just as the Lord had commanded. This was all accomplished because the Lord God of Israel was fighting for his people. Then Joshua and the Israelites rested from war as they returned to their camp at Gilgal. God had kept his promise to Joshua that he would be successful in taking the promised land. With Joshua as their leader, the Israelites had crossed the River Jordan and many of the towns and the cities in the promised land had been conquered. After seven years of battle, Israel had gained control of the land and now it was time to divide the land and allocate it to the different tribes. Joshua decided that it was time to dismiss the army. Each tribe would now be responsible for clearing out any remaining enemies from their own areas. The area of the Philistines and the Jezerites east of Egypt still remained. Joshua and the Israelites set up the tabernacle in a place called Shiloh in the middle of the Promised Land. This would be the place where all of Israel would come to worship. From here, Joshua sent out three men from each of the seven tribes throughout the territory to scout out the land so it could be divided up between them. When they returned, the Lord showed Joshua the drawing of the sacred lots showing which parts of the land should be allocated to each of the tribes. The division of the land was to follow the prophetic blessing of Jacob and Moses, and the remaining land was to be divided up by lot. First, Joshua assigned territory to the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh on the east side of the Jordan, which they had chosen because of the wonderful livestock country. This land had already been given to them by Moses. Next, the tribes of Judah and Joseph, which were Ephraim and the other half tribe of Manasseh, received the land that their ancestor Jacob had promised to them 450 years earlier. Because of Joseph's godly character, his sons received the richest and most fertile land in all of Canaan. Judah, who offered himself in exchange for his brother Benjamin, received the largest portion of land. The rest of the tribes divided up the remaining land by casting lots. Much of the land was still unconquered, but God's plan was to include it in the divisions among the tribes. God knew the future and what victories would be theirs. God wanted the tribes to finish the job of fully driving out all the inhabitants. One tribe, however, 
the Levites, were not to be given land, as they were the priests of the Lord. They were to spend all their time serving the people and leading them in worship. They consulted with Eliezer, the high priest, Joshua, and the leaders of the other tribes. They said, The Lord instructed Moses to give cities to the Levites for our homes and pasture land for our cattle. So the Levites were given cities scattered throughout the promised land where they could live and have land for their animals. The cities for the Levites were in every part of the land. They were not to own land, so their service to God would not be hindered. But they were to be supported by the donations of the other tribes. One of the tasks God wanted the Israelites to do when they entered the Promised Land was to designate certain cities as cities of refuge. Six cities were chosen three on the east side of the Jordan and three on the west side. Their purpose was to prevent injustice, especially in the case of revenge. For example, if someone accidentally kills someone, they could flee to a city of refuge and be protected from anyone wanting revenge. In a city of refuge, both Jews and foreigners would be given a fair trial. And if innocent, they could come and live there in safety. The Levites were in charge of these cities, and they were to make sure God's principles of justice and fairness were kept. So, in this way, the Lord gave to Israel all the land he had promised. They conquered it and lived there. God gave them peace, just as he had promised. Just before everyone left for their land, Joshua called together the troops from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, living east of the Jordan. He said, you have obeyed the Lord in every order I have given you, Joshua told them. Even though the campaign has lasted a long time, you have not deserted the other tribes. Now go and live in the land Moses promised you on the east of the river Jordan and continue to obey the Lord your God. Remember to be careful to love the Lord your God, walk in all his ways, to obey his commands, to hold fast to his commands, and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. The troops from these tribes headed for their lands, but before they crossed the river Jordan, they built a large monument in the shape of an altar on the west bank. When the tribes on the west of the river saw the altar, they were angry and feared the troops from the tribes to the east had set up a rival place of worship. Such was their fury that they were ready to go to war against their fellow Jews. Before attacking, they sent a delegation to the eastern tribes. It included Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the high priest, and a representative of each of the tribes. Why have you built an altar of rebellion against the Lord God, they asked. The one true altar of the Lord is at Shiloh. Here the Lord lives among us all. We have not built this altar in rebellion, the eastern tribes protested. The river Jordan acts as a barrier between our tribes and yours. 
we wanted this monument to remind your children that we too worship the Lord God. The altar is not for burnt offerings or sacrifices, but a symbol of the relationship that both of us have. We will only worship God at the altar in front of the tabernacle. Venus replied, Today we know that the Lord is with us because you have not rebelled against the Lord as we thought. Instead, you have saved us from destruction. Then Venus and the delegation returned to the tribes on the west side of the River Jordan and explained why the monument had been built. They were glad to hear the report and praised God. The people of Reuben and Gad named the altar, the altar of witness, saying, it is a witness between us and them that the Lord is our God too. The people of Israel were now back living in the land that God had promised them. They lived in cities and towns and were able to raise their herds of cattle and sheep on the grassy slopes of the hills. Those who lived in the valleys could have vineyards and raise grain. God had blessed them with a rich and beautiful land. In this lesson, we can learn some important life principles. First, we see that God is faithful in keeping his promises. He had given the land of Israel to the descendants of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. He had promised Moses that he would bring the Israelites out of slavery and return them to the promised land. And he did it. God had promised Joshua that if he obeyed the commandments of God, that he would give him victory in the land. With God's miraculous help, Joshua and the Israelites were very successful in regaining possession of the land. They won great battles against overwhelming odds because God intervened on their behalf. God's promises are sure and true for us today as well. We can depend on him to keep his word. One of the greatest promises that he has made to us is the promise that if we believe in him, we will have eternal life. God kept his promise to send his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. He rose again and went to heaven with the promise that we too will go to be with him someday. We can count on God to keep his promises. Another life principle illustrated in this biblical account is the example of the way that Israel solved a misconception about the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. When Joshua and the Israelites saw the altar they had built on the other side of the Jordan River, they assumed that these tribes were disobeying God. Instead of reacting in fear and judging these tribes falsely, Venus decided to send out a group of messengers to investigate the situation and to learn the truth. He learned that the memorial was not for pagan sacrifice, but a way to remember the unity of Israel to serve God. We too need to learn from this example when we are faced with resolving conflicts. We should not assume the worst 
before even trying to understand or find out the facts. We can avoid trouble and restore unity when we seek to discover the truth first. We should commit ourselves to not reacting before we hear the whole story. This will keep us from falsely accusing others and blaming them for things they did not do. God wants us to live peacefully together as members of His family. We also see in this lesson where God commanded the Israelites to establish cities of refuge or places of protection for people who had accidentally killed someone. The Lord wanted his people to be treated with mercy and forgiveness. Our memory verse is Psalms 9, 9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed and a stronghold in times of trouble. Just as God helped Joshua and his army defeat the enemy, he will also come to our rescue when we are facing a difficult situation. He promises to give us strength for the battle and to enable us to overcome temptation. We can trust in him. Let's say our verse again together. Psalms 9, 9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed and a stronghold in times of trouble. God is also merciful to us. When we confess our sin and seek to be obedient to his will, he does not give us what we deserve. He extends mercy and forgiveness to us. We should thank him for all his gifts of love toward us. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for recording this great story of your faithfulness to the children of Israel in the Bible. You promised Joshua and Israel that they would have great victories in gaining possession of the land, and you kept your word. Thank you that you have promised us a refuge in trouble and strength for living a life for you. Please help us to trust in your faithfulness. Thank you for the promise of eternal life when we confess our sin and ask for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remember, God is faithful to keep his promises. You keep your promises, promises Oh God, your word is like rock Promises You keep your promises, promises Oh God, your word is like rock